Well, good morning and welcome to church today. How are you? All right, would you stand and sing with us? We're going to praise the Lord for how good he is. Join us. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. Yeah, my parade belongs to you forever. This is my testimony from death to life, cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Come together, sons and daughters. Come together, sons and daughters. Bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Yes, our God will finish what He started. I'm not dead. I'm not dead and you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. I'm not dead and you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. I'm not dead and you're not done. You believe that today? Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead and you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. Sing this out of it's your testimony today. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. Now I'm alive. This is my testimony. From death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Let's have a shot today if that is your testimony. Out of the wilderness into your deliverance, look where I'm standing. These hands that once were chained Now lifted high in parades Look where I'm standing now Look where I'm standing now I stand on the chain breaking Miracle making Powerful name of Jesus On 
Father, God, I thank you, and I praise your name alone, the powerful name of Jesus, that I am free. Lord, I thank you that you break chains. I thank you that you save prodigals. I thank you that you take dead things and make them alive. I am living proof of that, God. And I praise the name of Jesus alone, the powerful name of Jesus that does all those things and so many more. I thank you. I praise you. I give you the glory today. Amen. Thank you for singing with us today. Go ahead and take a seat. And while you do that, take a look at this video. We had a team who just went to Mexico, our Go Mexico team. And we want to share with you a little bit about what they did when they were down there. Where are you all going? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Just San Diego. Good deal. We're going to Tijuana via. Ah, uh, I got gotcha. you.
Good morning, church. As you can see, we had an amazing time. We had a fantastic team that got along great. We're all in these black shirts today and served with all their gifts and talents. Who knew there would be boxing on a missions trip, right? <laughs> uh, using what we had for the Lord. And we loved seeing our missionary, Efren and Miriam Marin. They, he oversees two churches. One is Jesus Impacto de Amor, and one is La Vida Eternal. That's the end of my Spanish, okay? <laughs> uh, and a recovery program, and a dump site ministry, and he's on the go, and training pastors and missionaries. We were kind of in awe. <laughs> I don't want to take all the thunder, so I'm going to let them share also. Uh, but we were impacted by their sacrifice, by their level of commitment, and it, it changed us. And I wanted you to get to hear from two of the people from the team, and then if you want to hear later, teaser, we're going to share in the studio afterwards uh, more of the whole team is going to share, and uh, you can hear what God did in us and through us. And first, I want to introduce you to Debbie. Good morning, everyone. My name is Debbie, like she said. I was part of the team that went down two weeks ago. And um, I just wanted to start off by thanking you for your contribution and for those of you who may, kind of paved the way for us all to be able to go. And I can tell you it was life-changing. Um, I did a lot of the translating for the group. and All of it. She was the voice of everyone. <laughs> um, and I can tell you that I, my perspective was completely changed. This was my first mission trip that I've ever been to um, outside of the country. And seeing um, what the Lord is doing in, the, in this ministry with Pastor Fred and the group of pastors that he's trained and seeing the lives that have been changed. And just it was so perspective changing on the way I view missions, the way I view my giving, and the way I view um, serving Christ even here at church um, Pastor has been talking a lot about our mission statement and how we can serve and putting that into action. And I, it completely, the way they serve, completely challenged me in the way I view serving the Lord. So it was a lot that we learned. We, I really hope you come to our presentation after church. I feel like I can talk a little longer. Our missionary even said, I only have 27 years. 27 years? What? what? Yeah, I'm going to be 70 in 27 years, I need to serve God now. Wow, okay, what happens at 70? Yeah, well. <laughs> but there was an intensity because lives are at stake, literally, physically. The recovery people, the dump people, and eternally. Dave, I know it super impacted you. Can you tell us how? Yeah, just even watching that video, was, I got emotional, you know. Yeah. But yeah, uh, I wanted to talk about... Um, the brother out there that impacted me the most, his name is Julia Contreras. Um, he's, a, he's the pastor out there at the dump. Um, you know, I, we, call it, we call it a dump out there, uh, but they call it Esperanza, which translates to hope. Um, you know, in the world where moral decay has become the norm, uh, he showed us that remaining righteous and holy, it's, it's, not, it's not easy, but it's not possible either. This guy sacrifices everything. Uh, his relationship, work, um, just to be out there. Uh, he lives out there by choice um, because he wants to be accessible to the people out there. Uh, we see children out there, newborns. Um, there's cranes constantly shifting trash around, and there's even stories of people falling asleep and getting crushed by the trash. Um, it's horrible. When I asked him what would be the most helpful to him out there, he said clean water. And you know, I know, I know a lot of us, we open bottles of water, we just leave it, and uh, we just end up throwing it away. So we take a lot for granted out here in the States. And, uh, you know, I just encourage everyone to, when they get an opportunity to go serve, that you take it. Because it will change your life and the lives of others. So that's all I got to say about that. But it was awesome. And in the, in the boxing, that was great. You know, I got to teach the little kid. They loved it. It was awesome. But, uh, yeah. That was a highlight, the boxing, as you can imagine. Oh, yeah. Quick. Thank you. As you know, we sold tamales, and we took down $5,500.
And the day after we left, they painted the outside of one of the churches, and they started on a bathroom remodel because they had the funds to do it. And we used the bathroom. It was just barely a few toilets set up with some wood around it. Uh, so they needed those bathrooms. And so thank you for uh, your part in it, praying and giving. And this is just a, a, a little teaser of more stories to tell. So we hope you'll join us over in the studio next to the chapel after church. Yeah, and thank I want to thank you guys for your support. And thank, I want to thank my team, Susan and Pastor Scott, for the opportunity. Okay, thank you, everybody. Good morning, Church on the Hill family. How are you doing? Was that a wonderful message to hear about our GO team? I'm, I was touched. Let's give a round of applause for our, our GO team. I think that's one of the things God just wants us to be willing and available, and, and you guys were willing and available. I appreciate you for doing that. I also want to welcome uh, those of you that may be new to Church on the Hill. Thank you for coming today. Uh, if this is your first, maybe it's your second time coming, thank you for doing that. Uh, but don't be a stranger. Don't just pew, zip for the exits. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to know about it. Um, if you'd like to talk to people, you can go to our info desk, let them know that you're here, let them know where you're from. We'd love to connect with you. If you're not as social, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, you can fill out one of the connect cards right in the front seat pocket in the uh, chair in front of you. Or you can just text Koth Connect to 94000. Um, the holidays, it's an interesting time. Um, typically, we're, can you believe we're about three weeks away from Thanksgiving? I know, it's kind of crazy to think about. Um, typically, Thanksgiving is a time that we you know, might unlock, un unbuckle a belt buckle and get ready for a turkey coma, typically. Uh, but for some people, it's difficult um, due to the loss of a, a close loved one, a friend, a job change, have to move away, or whatever that may be. Um, and also, during this time, uh, Church on the Hill is going to offer a, a seminar called Surviving the Holidays. It's actually coming up this week on Wednesday, November 9th at 7 p.m. right here in the studio. Um, and it's a time to talk about those emotions that uh, some of us go through. Um, some, what, what do we do with all of that? What do, how do we process? How do we get through it? So a few of our, our church members, you can invite friends, you can come yourself. We would encourage those that are interested to come by for this seminar uh, so we can kind of process, what do we do with this? Don't just sit at home. Don't just, ah, I'm just going to deal with it. Because sometimes it's difficult to deal with. So we encourage those that may be uh, dealing with these emotions during that time to do that. So remember, Wednesday, November 9th at 7 p.m. Next, we're going to pause to take our offering. Now, we want to thank those that have continued to be generous with your, uh, your funds, your, your money. We, we appreciate it. God appreciates it. Um, if this is your first time coming to Church on the Hill, you can disregard this message. But for those that call Church on the Hill my church, this is your time to give. Now, let's open up our Bibles. Let's open up our notes as we receive our word today from Pastor Josh. Thanks, Talents. Good morning, everybody. Oh, you did get an extra hour of sleep last night. Yeah, I can tell. That's going to be exciting. All right. Um, yeah, it's good to see you guys. This is week two for me. You guys know that I was here last week. Well, if you were here last week, I was here last week. And so I'm excited to be back up and to share with you guys again. I'm excited that you are here. And if you weren't here last week or you don't remember, what we're doing is we started a study in the book of Colossians, and we're calling it core sample. And what a core sample is, is it's a geology term for when you dig down into the earth and you get a sample for what's below the surface, and then that tells you what can be built on top of that area. And so the reason why we're calling it core sample is because Paul is writing to this young church in Colossae that's coming under some persecution, and he's really trying to make sure that their foundation is stable that the most important things are set so that they can build a healthy church and a healthy relationship on top of it. And so last week, we dug into Colossians 1, 9 to 14. And this week, we're going to continue walking through, and we're going to be in Colossians 1, 15 to 23. And I will tell you this, it is jam-packed. 
It's crazy how full of content it is and how much is in there. And I would love to explain it all to you, but if I did, we would be here for hours. And so we're gonna kinda, we're gonna hit some of it, we're gonna skip over some of it, but before we do that, let me pray for us and then we'll get started. Lord, I thank you for everyone that's here this morning. I thank you for the fact that you meet us here, Lord. Um, and Lord, I just ask that as we read this passage and try to have a better understanding of who you are, Lord, that you would grab our hearts, that you would make it real to us, Lord, that it would be something that truly influences and impacts us, Lord. Lord, I thank you so much for how much you love us and how involved you are. Amen. Okay, so we're going to start out with something really easy, okay? I promise you, this is not a trick question, very easy. Can you guys put the first slide up there? What is that? Yeah, that extra hour of sleep has got you guys going. Look at you, you're on point. Uh, that is lightning. And to me, it's unbelievable that we have a picture of lightning. Just think about that. Think about how quick lightning moves. Think about all the things that go into lightning. And I know for all you naysayers that are like, Josh, it's a video, and they took a still image, okay? I don't care. It's still unbelievable that we got a still image out of that, and we have pictures of lightning. And if you go online and you search lightning, we got a lot of them. We have ones where there's even multiple strikes going at the same time, and it blows my mind that we have pictures of lightning and that's not even to mention what is actually taking place with lightning. How quick it goes, how hot it is, the things that are actually going on when that takes place. Unbelievable, right? You guys don't agree with me, seriously? Lightning doesn't impress you? What do you want from me? Uh, well, just go home. This is going to be boring then. If lightning doesn't get your attention, we're done. But lightning in a picture of it is amazing. But here's what I think we would all agree on. To experience it firsthand is a completely different thing. I can remember a few years ago, I was out on a dirt biking trip with my brother and my dad and my nephew and a few other people, and we were kind of in the greater Sugar Bowl area, like on the backside of Sugar Bowl, kind of in the greater Tahoe area, and we were camped right along this ravine. And on the ravine, when you looked out past it, we just had this completely open view of the mountains and the trees and everything else. And one of the nights, as we were kind of, we're getting back to camp and we're done riding, we've just finished eating, all of a sudden a storm starts to roll in. And in that storm, all of a sudden the lightning just starts to flash across the sky. And then all of a sudden the lightning really starts to go. And as the storm moves closer, all of us were literally just sitting there in our chairs, staring out at this valley, just watching the lightning flash across the sky and dance across the horizon. And as it moves in, I will never forget sitting there and feeling the percussion of the thunder just smack me in the chest. And to sit there and watch lightning strike and then go, boo. It was crazy. And I sat there just in awe of what was taking place. And I remember as the rain started dumping on us, I was like, I don't care. I'm not going in. Like, this is once in a lifetime. I'm not going to miss this. This is unbelievable. And I think all of us can agree with this. That picture, it's amazing. It's great. But the experience... That's a completely different ballgame. That's a whole different world. And so this morning, that's what I want us to wrestle with. That's what I want us to think about. Because as we dig into Colossians 1, 15 to 23, I think it's an idea that a lot of us know and have heard. But my question is, do we believe it in an intellectual picture sort of way? Or do we believe it in a life application This changes every day and every decision sort of way? because it leads to two completely different experiences. But before we can answer that question, we have to dig into the passage, and like I told you, there's a lot, and it's full, so we're gonna go quickly, and we're walking through every single verse. Are you guys ready? Because here we go. Verse 15, Paul says this, 
He says, the sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Boom. (laughs) Paul just comes out with it. You want to know who the son is? He's the image of the invisible God. If you don't understand or you don't know God or if God's invisible, so you go, how do I figure God out? Paul just says, look at the son. If you want to understand God, if you want to understand his quality and his characteristics, look at the son. That's one way to get someone's attention. Then he moves on. He's the firstborn over all creation. And what Paul is saying is not that he was the first physical human being, like he was in the garden when Adam and Eve were there, and he was just in the corner hiding, like, I'm Jesus, I'm super good at hide and seek. That's, that's not the image we're supposed to get. The image is the idea of the firstborn, and the firstborn in this time had rights and specific things that were just for them because they were the firstborn. But what was most important was they had sovereign authority. They were the ones to make the choices. They were the ones that everything ran through. They were the most important. And what Paul is saying is, without question, the Son is the image of God, and he is most important. He has the sovereign authority. That's a way to start a paragraph. Verse 16, he moves on. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, All things have been created through him and for him. Paul is getting after it. (laughs) He's literally saying every single thing in this entire galaxy, in this universe, in this planet, in your body, in everything, it was created by him, through him, and for him. All of it. So when you're watching planet Earth and you see this awesome little thing about some part of the reef and it's this tiny ecosystem and it all works together and it's all this unbelievable stuff, he did that. And when you come to the other side and you hear these crazy stats of like, man, we finally think we kind of have an idea how big the sun is and there's so many of the Earth that can fit inside the sun. And then we found out it's not even the biggest burning ball. There's other bigger burning stars out there. He did that. But I think the most important question that it answers is the existential question that every single person on every single continent has asked for all of mankind. Who am I and what was I created for? And Paul goes, you know what? I'll tackle that one too. You were created by the Son, and you were created for the Son. Who are you? You're a creation of the Son. What are you here for? To honor him, to glorify him, to bear his image, to grow in a relationship with him, and to worship him. We move on. Verse 17, it says, He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. What that means is that the son did not appear on the scene when he became Jesus in the manger. He was before that. He's part of the triune God, the three in one, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He was before, before, and will be after, after. And if you think I'm going to try to explain all that right now, you're wrong. But it goes on to say, in him all things hold together. Every single system, that huge sun in the solar system and everything else, in that tiny little ecosystem on a coral reef, It all holds together in him, but beyond that, you hold together in him. He's holding your life, your way, your body. He's holding it together. The reason why you have life is through him. As I was doing research on this, I came across this story, and I just had to share it with you guys. There's a pastor that was talking about this passage, and then someone came up to him after And they said, hey, I'm a molecular biologist, and I'm really interested in this part where you said, in him all things hold together, because as a molecular biologist, we're still kind of trying to figure out what is it that actually does hold everything together. Like, we understand a lot of the things that we have, but why do they hold together as they do? And he says, one of the discoveries we've made in the human body is that there's actually a base protein that is holding most of us together. 
And he goes, that protein is called laminin. I think that, that could be wrong, but it's close to that. But it's laminin, and he goes, when you get home, you should research it and check it out. That's the cell structure or the base model structure of laminin. And this pastor looks at it and he goes, that's absolutely incredible. Now, am I standing here today going, look at that. That's what's holding your body together is a bunch of little crosses. So therefore, God is blah, 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 blah. No. But what I am doing is this. I'm looking at this passage going, he says that he holds everything together. And in that truth of what he says, he's also so creative that he's put his stamp even into your body to where what holds your body together is essentially a bunch of tiny little crosses. <laughs> Just like here, have a cool, fun little discovery. Just another picture of me. He holds everything together. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. We're not going to spend much time here. What this is really saying is he's, the son is in charge of all of it. And because he is everything, he has authority over everything. The head of the church is him. It doesn't matter what any pastor or any other person really has to say. He is the head. Our job is to be following him and let him guide and let him lead because he has supreme authority. And then it says in verse 19, for God's for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. That means that the fullness of God is fully dwelling, represented in the Son. Fully God, fully man. And the point that I have to make here that's so important is what this means for us is this. There is no addition to the Son. There is no belief system that says we can have the son and that's a good thing, but we also need some other things or some other knowledge or some higher understanding to supplement that. What Paul is saying is no. The son and the son alone is fully submission or sufficient as the complete embodiment of who God is. There is no adding or subtracting to that. He alone is complete. Then in verse 20, it says, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And what Paul is saying is the son, he is all those different things, but he made a choice to reconcile all things to right relationships. He made a choice to be the sacrifice, to reconcile and make right all the things that had gone away from him. And so by his blood, everything is made right. Through his blood is the only way everything is made right. And then to compound on this, in verse 21 to 22, it says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. Your choices, my choices, my evil, my bad choices, my things I regret messed up my relationship. It tore me away from the person I was created to be in God. Through the Son, I was created to be something, and I messed it up through my sins, through my struggles, through the things I regret. And so did you. But the sacrifice of the Son on the cross, His blood shed, restores you to right relationship. And through that and through that alone, you stand holy in His sight, without blemish and free from accusation. The only way we will ever experience the freedom, the peace, and the joy that is talked about is through the sacrifice 
of the blood shed on the cross to fulfill the Old Testament covenant for Christ to take that punishment and to say, I have restored you and I have reconciled you. You stand without judgment. You stand pure and free, unaccused of the things that you've done because of his blood shed for you and for me. And then Paul hits us with this in verse 23 at the end. He says, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. But he puts this if there. And the if really gets our attention because it seems so conditional. But as I studied this and as I dug into this, I think the way that I would try to portray this if is this. On one side, we have an if that is like if I'm in a dating relationship or if I'm looking to date and I go to someone and I say, I wonder if, or I'm wondering if you would like to go on a date with me. I'm wondering if you will go to dinner with me. That is a genuine if. I do not know the answer. I don't know what I'm going to get for that, right? But then on the other side, if we come over here and it's in a marriage or it's in a wedding situation and we're talking about traditional vows and we tweak them a little bit and we say, if you are willing to stick with this person in sickness and in health, if you're willing to be together through good times and bad times, Over here, we have an if that is very much a genuine if. We're asking a question we don't know what we're going to get. But on this side, we have an if that is a very assumed, you are going to continue this. This is what you're supposed to You shouldn't be weighing this question right now. You should have already had this question figured out. If not, we have problems. It's a weird ceremony, all those things. But this should be taken care of. But if you do this, like I assume you will, then you will experience the gospel. Then you will experience the truth. And so as we come to the end of this passage, we go back to the original question, and it's do you really believe it? And it's not just do you really believe it, it's Does your life actions portray a belief of this? Do we live life more like it's a picture? Like we have an intellectual concept that the son is in charge of everything, through him everything was made, by him everything's made, everything holds together in him, and kind of intellectually that's where I'm at? Or do we actually have an experience of it? Do we live life in a way where we go, Christ, you actually are everything. My actions prove that all things were created by you, through you, and for you, and in all things, you hold everything together. Because it's a huge, huge difference. And the other thing that I think we're getting at is when Paul says, established and firm, And do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. I think another way of saying that is, how's your doubt? How much do you doubt what was said in this? And I'm not saying this in a judgmental, how dare you doubt sort of way. I have doubts too. I have questions and things I struggle with. But how is your level of doubt? Because if we're honest about this, we live in an area that looks at our belief system and sometimes just flat out disregards it. I talk to kids in high school and in college, and they're definitely not getting support for the way that they believe. And I know for a lot of you, you're at jobs where everything is, you know, it's high tech or it's super intelligent or very science-based or whatever else. And my question is, have we gotten to a place where there's so much pressure that we've been begin to kind of shrink back? Have we taken a step back from this belief and gone, maybe I don't? fully grab onto that. 
Has the pressure of work or the outside world brought you to the place where maybe there's been some deviations from this truth? Maybe we've gotten a little embarrassed of our actual beliefs and gone, ooh, I'm going to go Jesus, but then a tweak. I'm going to take some Jesus, but an adjustment with it. I'm going I'm to make a little bit of a gray area. And the reason why I bring this up is I think what Paul is partly what he's getting at is this is so important because when we doubt, often what happens is we freeze. Let me explain this to you. If I'm on a hike and I'm walking through the wilderness and I'm on a trail and all of a sudden that trail leads me to this big ravine with rushing water underneath it and there's a bridge going over that ravine. If I look at that bridge and I go, ooh, I don't know if that thing's going to hold me. You know what I don't do? Walk across it. Yeah, and that's smart. That's basic knowledge right there, right? But if I don't trust that that bridge is going to hold, then I'm not going to walk across it. When I have too many doubts about that bridge, I just freeze But the problem is, if I never take the steps to walk out onto that bridge and put it into action, then I never actually believe it's going to hold me. And it's only when I walk out onto that bridge and it does hold me that my faith and my trust begins to grow. And the more times I walk out onto that bridge and I put my faith and my trust in it, and the more time it holds me, then the more my faith and my trust begins to grow. But often we get stuck in this place where our doubts and our questions make it so we don't move. And we think that coming here and listening to me give answers or Scott give answers or some pastor online give answers or having a conversation is going to solve our doubts and our questions. And I would say all too often it doesn't work that way. Because that's just an intellectual idea. That's just the picture. And it's not until we actually put it into practice in our life and have the experience that we actually trust it and believe it. So my question is, what has your doubt caused you to do? And again, this is not me saying you can't have doubts. Just the other week, my seven-year-old daughter brought up heaven and was asking all these questions of like, what happens to family and what about relationships and doesn't eternity seem too long? And I was like, yeah. Yeah, I don't have that answer. And then I went on a long trip and I thought about it for a long time. Still no answer. But if our doubts freeze us, Often we just get stuck and we don't experience what Paul is talking about because it's just an intellectual picture and it's not a life experience of the son is actually in control of all of it. And so as we have those doubts, do you continue to move? Do you continue to pursue? Do you continue to put this into action? Or has it frozen you? Because the result is two completely different things. I think an example of this would be this. If we just have a picture and an intellectual belief when we come into a job situation, we go, Lord, would you please help me get this job? Would you give me the right answers? Would you make this interview go well? Would you provide for me and my family in a way that you know, we're grateful for? Would you please help with that? But if we come at it from a life experience sort of way and say the son has created everything and everything is for him and through him and in him all things hold together, then we come to our job and even if it's our dream job that pays way more than the bills and gives us security and gives us all these things, we look at our job and go, if this is not making me more the man that God has called me to be, then I will leave that job. 
It does not control me because my identity is not in who this job says I am. My security and my comfort is not in the amount of money that this job is paying me. Because if the son holds all things in his hand, then he controls it, not the job. So is your life more of an intellectual picture or is it an actual life experience? And this plays into so many different things. I know for me, a great check is this. Just look at my bank account. Turns out pastors usually aren't the richest people in the Bay Area. Shocker, I know. But I can tell from myself when I look at my bank account and I struggle and it turns into an argument with my wife or it turns into not sleeping or it turns into all these different problems, I am living as though it's just a picture. It's an intellectual belief, but I have not moved to the place where I say, son, you are in control of other, all of it. God, you've got it all, and you're holding it all together. So I can trust you way more than that bank account or anything else. And this is between you and God. I don't know what this is for you. I don't know if it's a health scare. I don't know if it's your bank account. I don't know if it's your job, your identity. I don't know what this is. But I would say for most of you, God is probably pointing out something in your heart right now where you're going, ooh, I might just be living with a picture and not a life experience. Maybe for some of you, it's your kids and their future. I'm around so many people with our little ones where we're already, it's like second grade and they're already set on how do we make sure they get to the right grade so they can get to the right school, so they can get to the right college, and then when they get to the right college, they'll get the right career, and when they get the right career, then they'll be able to get the right spouse, and they'll be taken care of, and they'll be set. It's just a picture. And you can ask God to bless it the whole way, and every time they turn in an application, you can pray about that application, but the truth is, you're not really living as though the son is who he says he is until you go, more important than the grades or the school is who you are in your relationship with the Father. So more than I invest in your grades, I'm going to invest in you in your relationship. Because that will change everything. So again, I don't know where this sits with you, but I know that all too often our doubts are not solved with conversations and answers from others. Our doubts are solved by stepping out in faith and going, okay, I'm going to live like you are who you say you are, that you have created all things that you created me for you and you are holding me together with a bunch of tiny little crosses. But I'm going to put my trust and my faith in that and it's not just going to be an intellectual belief that's a picture. It will be my identity and it will lead to how I do my life. Because the truth of this is this. There is no chance we will ever experience the life that God has for us, the joy, the peace, the freedom, the forgiveness, if we're just living by the picture of an intellectual belief. The freedom and fulfillment, the peace and the love and the joy that God has for you is only going to be experienced if you live this life that he's called you to. That's why Paul says, if you continue. If you continue, then you will take hold of the truth of the gospel. And my promise for every single one of you as we close is this. If we live the life based on the truth of the gospel, it will far exceed anything that we've ever created for ourselves. The freedom and the joy and the peace that God has for you is so much greater than anything you ever could have gotten on your own. But it's our choice of whether or not we're going to step out into that and go, okay, God, 
I will live how you have called me to live. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you so much for a passage like this that establishes who you really are. Father, you have created all things. You hold all things together, and that includes every single one of us and every single part of our life. Lord, I was created by you and for you, and so was every single person in this room. I ask that you would help us to live that out. Lord, give us the boldness and the courage to put our trust into you and not just have it be an intellectual belief, but to have it be a life-altering belief where we live for you. We live with a deep conviction and a belief that you are who you say you are. And we can trust it. I love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. She stand and sing with us. You say Christ is my firm foundation. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaking I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful through generations I got joy in chaos. I still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength. Cause I've built my life on Jesus. Cause he's never
We sing when the rain comes, when the storm comes. Our faith is built on the foundation of Jesus. Let's sing it out. on you I'm safe with you I'm gonna make it through Rain King our truth that we stand on. Thank you for singing with us or being with us today. Have a great rest of your Sunday. We'll see you next week. God bless.